welcome everybody and thank you for coming, especially in this wonderful afternoon that is the last thing we want to do is look at a screen, but um, thank you for coming here. We don't know what here is, is somewhere in between places. Okay. In the cloud. Right, so, um, and we, sh we should thank the library for allowing us to use their virtual capabilities and hosting in, 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 in a way this conversation that otherwise would have been in the Bonday room uh, in the, in the uh, library. And I always say, imagine this pandemic 30, 40 years ago without the internet, how we would <laughs> have been doing things impossible. Anyway, um, I would like to start by recognizing that the Human Rights Commission has been uh, putting an event every year for the International Day of Peace. And this year, since we didn't have a separate event and was just last Monday, the 21st, we would like to dedicate to the International Day of Peace this gathering today. And it's very uh, appropriate because the theme this year is shaping peace together. And so th this is perfect for what we're doing here. And it's, it's been, this will mark the 18th year that this community has been celebrating the International Day of Peace, that is in the United Nations, as you know, uh, day. Uh, and so I, I would like to start by saying, uh, well, my name, uh, Marva de Cantos, part of the Human Rights Commission, uh, but I would like to start by sharing a thought and think of, of this. We are on Dakota land. Think for a moment about this, the, the weight it carries, what it means. And this is uh, why we're doing this land acknowledgement because we are on the color land. Um, it, this work that the Human Rights Commission with other members in the community and the, both colleges we've been doing is clearly a work that is connected with social and, and, and racial justice. So the, it has, this work has many layers, has many ways of approaching this work and, and this uh, working on representation, working on telling the full history of our region, that's clearly part of this, this pursuit of, of this social justice and, and so very important in this time in history, especially. Uh, if you worry that if somebody wants to listen to this in Spanish and we don't have bilingual, uh, uh, right now, uh, Lucy Gonzalez Miron, that is also part of the Human Rights Commission, and myself, we're also part of the radio show in Spanish, the Super Barrio Latino. So we've been talking about this with our audience, and we've been sharing the, the statement, translating it into Spanish. So there, uh, the the immigrant community from Spanish-speaking uh, countries is aware of, of this work. So just before introducing Meredith McCoy, that she's so generous. I mean, we're so lucky. Uh, I cannot even begin to express our gratitude to her. But um, before um, I, we start with that, just uh, I'm going to be very brief. So we have time for not only the presentation, but, but your questions. Um, this, this work to me is, is very personal in, in many ways. I come from Spain. And as you know, Spain and the Americas have a very uh, difficult history in our past. And so coming from the colonizer country, even though we're not colonizing anymore anybody, uh, but coming from that, that country to me is very important to recognize that past, to recognize what are the uh, many, many difficult things that happen, all the uh, injustices and all the uh, um, um, uh, how hard it was for the people in the Americas to have that uh, presence of, of the Europeans. So for me, it's very personal. It's, it's very uh, important for me to do this work. And in working on the land acknowledgement, I, I realized that I don't only have to, in a way, apologize to people from Mexico or other Latin American countries, but also to the Minnesota people specifically because there was a British spy that was uh, helping the Spaniards to displace people here and to just uh, go ahead with untruthful treaties. So it is, it is incredible, the, the long range of the Spaniards in, in that time in history. So uh, to me, it's very personal. And again, uh, in, in my own family, people don't think this way. They don't think we have to 
um, talk about this past or repair what happened uh, or try to bring it to light now and, and kind of offer an apology. But that's the way I view it and to me is, is very important. So the Human Rights Commission started on this uh, path of, of working with um, this, telling the, the rightful story and, and the full story of the Native American people in, in our area uh, two years ago. And it was actually out of a different, a different international day of peace. And they, we started the work to have the city embrace the Indigenous Peoples Days that, as you know, is celebrated instead of Christopher Columbus Day. And, and, and again, to me, that's, that's very personal. I think for many, many, in, in, in many times uh, throughout my years here in Northfield since 98, I, I, I'm usually the only one from Spain. So um, it, it was a no brainer to me to just not celebrate uh, a, a holiday that comes with a, a very difficult past, but instead doing the Indigenous Peoples Days. And we were very grateful that the council approved it. And so we have been celebrating this year will be the third time. Um, then we were approached by both colleges and they sent uh, both Bruce King and your Hargis, Bruce King from San Olaf and your Hargis from um, Carlton. And we, uh, in a very organic way, we started to create this group to work on the land acknowledgement. The students at both colleges said, we're late. Other colleges around the state already have this. They, they're implementing it. They're reading the statement. When the school uh, year starts, we are behind. So we, we've been working for uh, almost two years on, on this. And in that work, every word that is in the statement was carefully chosen. It was, it was days of working on the wording. So, um, and we were very lucky that Meredith uh, joined the group uh, while we were working on this. So she lent her expertise, her vision, being a professor from Carlton. Of course, she comes with a background of knowledge that uh, and, and also is personal for her. So that, that, was, that was wonderful that we had that, uh, that input. And we try to, uh, we've been trying to send this statement to the city council and being approved as a city statement as well, not just the colleges. And we are still uh, in that conversation. We've tried it already twice and we're gonna try it a third time. Uh, there were some uh, concerns about some of the words. There were concerns about there's not enough education to the community. Of course, all of this, uh, happened in March and then the pandemic happened so we couldn't meet. Uh, the city wasn't allowing boards and commissions to meet so it's, it's been slower than we have hoped for but here we are finally with this education kind of forum for the community to talk about this this important work. And as it is now, the both colleges, the uh, the Senate from San Olaf on April the 28th was approved by the, the Senate uh, Student Senate, and it is now on the website. If you go to History of San Olaf, that's the first thing you encounter, which is pretty bold and, and wonderful that this is the case. And Carlton, when they started the school year, if you had the opportunity to go to the convocation, President Post Cancer started the conversation with the land acknowledgement as, as we have it. So this, this is great. This is wonderful work. Um, and uh, we're gonna just have the great presentation that Meredith already did for the Human Rights Commission. And it so happened that she also speaks Spanish, so she could do it in both languages. And, and Lucy was so appreciative that she could follow the conversation 100%. So um, we're very grateful, Meredith, Go ahead with your wonderful PowerPoint and enlighten us <laughs> with your knowledge. Thank you so much. Mar, thank you so much for the welcome and, and for the introduction. Um, I consider it a blessing to have gotten to work with you and with the other folks on the task force. Um, and I also wanna say a special note of thank you to my Carlton family who's here. Lots of my students have somehow magically found their way to this call. And thank you so much for taking your evening to hang out with us. Um, can you see my screen okay? Thank you so much. All right. 
So uh, I'm going to start by introducing myself uh, in my language, in the way that I've been taught to. Um, so, Buju and Dinoy Maganidog, Meredith McLean, Dishnikaz, Jidal Knindodem, Nokomaji Mekanakwaju, Gai and Dao, the Kavakang. Um, so what I just said is, hi, my relatives. My name is Meredith McCoy. Uh, my family uh, is from Turtle Mountain. My dad is a citizen of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa Indians. I'm um, Crane Clan, and I currently live in Minneapolis. The folks that you've got on your screen right now are my family. It's important for me to come to you by grounding myself first in my family so that you can see who I come from, who formed my knowledge base. Um, so the people that you've got on the screen, um, this is my dad as a high school student. Um, my mom, my mom there as a tot with her mother, her grandmother, and her great-grandmother. Um, this is my, my dad's mother hiding out there with my great-grandmother and, and her siblings. Um, these are my mother's parents who were both educators. And the reason that's so important is to share that I come from a family of educators and moreover a family of educators interested in social justice. My grandfather, Ray Bruce, was involved in the uh, desegregation of schools in Arkansas and Georgia. And then my great grandparents are here, my father's grandparents, and uh, Gideon Nicholas and Christine Vilnav. And the reason they're here with me tonight is because they were both uh, students at the Federal Indian Boarding School System, which was an incredibly violent and coercive assimilationist boarding school, uh, federal school system, uh, in which students were, um, the motto of the school system was kill the Indian and save the man. So the idea was that you could somehow train students' identities out of them and train them to be white. Um, and so I always come to public presentations and to my classes, understanding that the reason that I have to do this work is because of the educational experiences that they had and the ways in which I'm trying to counteract those experiences and those narratives now. So I'm going to start us off with just a brief introduction to what land acknowledgements are, how did they become popular, what do they typically feature. So just at its basis, a land acknowledgement is just a statement. Now, often the idea is that it is not a statement that stays static rather that it is a statement that involves, uh, that evolves over time and that is the result of sort of processes of engagement and relationships. They are statements that can come from cities or schools, museums, uh, other government agencies, and their, their particular role is to acknowledge both the historic, present, and then we should also say and future relationships of indigenous peoples to a particular place, to their homelands. And in that they also have to be really explicit about what happened such that indigenous peoples did, did not end up with sole claim over their homelands, with sole stewardship rights over their homelands, and really explicitly acknowledging those legacies of dispossession. These have become increasingly common over the last several years in Canada. And in some ways, we can look to Canada as a model because Canada is much further along than we are in this process. And one of the critiques that continues to come up over and over again in Canada is that these become sort of performative statements where people feel that by standing up and saying their land acknowledgement, they've now checked all the boxes and that's it, we can go home, we did our social justice work for the day. And importantly, we can learn from them that that's not working. That's not converting anything into actual meaningful social change. And so we do have to think about the land acknowledgement starts and then what do we do about it? And those are the kinds of action steps that I hope we'll start thinking about this evening. They are really useful tools. And here you're gonna see some um, quotations from other institutions that have their own land acknowledgements and have uh, explained their thinking and, and why they've adopted them. So one is that it gives us a common language around understanding a shared history. And they help us to understand that colonialism is not something in the past. Many of us, when we came through school, we were taught that the colonial period ended, but we know that we live in a society that is still run by a group occupying indigenous territory. So colonialism never ended. We live in what some scholars have called a settler colonial state. But there's a grassroots organization that if you, if you go to their website, they have a very lengthy list of all of the many things that they believe land acknowledgements do. And I just want to note a few here that they allow us when we say them at the beginning of meetings an opportunity to ground ourselves with a sense of respect that we know that we're coming to this in a good way. They also, again, create this sort of shared narrative that we can then use as a starting place for conversation. And they prompt us to begin to do that work of repairing relationships with the indigenous nations whose lands we're occupying. In that, they allow us to tell the truth about difficult histories that we might otherwise want to avoid, and they should push us to tangible action. 
So as we think about crafting a land acknowledgement statement, which those of us who were involved in the task force have already worked on quite a bit, the very first step from the Native Governance Center is to be engaged in a process of reflection. I was just on a call with a student who was helping us think through anti-racist action at Carleton, and the student was thinking about these questions of why are we doing this work? And if we don't have that why extremely clearly articulated, then the work might not be sustainable. It might be a thing that we decide to do in the present moment because we feel like we're supposed to, but if we don't have that why, that commitment really clear for ourselves, then it's unlikely to lead to ongoing and sustainable action. So the first thing is being really clear about our purpose in what we're doing. And then we have to do the research. There is a lot of misinformation about indigenous histories. This is something that I try to counteract in my coursework. Uh, the fact is that national narratives around indigenous people are not always based in fact, they're often based in caricature. And so we have to do this deep work of undoing that misinformation and doing the research about whose lands we're on, what are the relationships of those indigenous peoples to these lands in the present moment, what are the legal documents, the treaties that have changed those relationships over time. Land acknowledgements are not a place to be vague or evasive. It is critical that we be exceedingly transparent and specific in the language that we use. Otherwise, we get to do this sort of dance of not really wanting to engage with the actual history, which is often a violent history. So we have to be comfortable with the discomfort, right? One of my, uh, of my faculty members in grad school used to call this a, a generative discomfort. So a kind of engagement with difficult histories, with hard histories that moves us to change. But if we're not being explicit about what those hard histories are, they're unlikely to lead to transformation. We have to consider that indigenous peoples are still here. This is perhaps obvious. You have an indigenous person sitting in front of you giving this presentation, but it is for too many people, not something that occurs to them right off the bat that right, indigenous peoples don't just have a relationship to this place in the past. For us, our homelands remain significant. Our homelands will continue to be significant to us and we will continue to cultivate relations with our homelands. So we have to think about these things in terms of present and future tenses. And in that, we should be thinking about how does this action, how does the action that result from the land acknowledgement support indigenous peoples and native nations? How is this going to result in indigenous nations being able to have more stewardship over their lands, better able to exercise their sovereignty? Not, and this is, it's critical that we not think about this in any sort of a paternalistic, we can offer a hand and help people kind of way, but how can we be good, equal partners? How can we become, as the Emmy, nominated film Don Land talks about, how can we become neighbors with legitimacy where we are doing the right thing by our Dakota neighbors? So a few steps here. Strong land acknowledgements. Need to think about this process of strengthening and sustaining relationships with Native nations. Now, to my mind, this can happen before or after the text of the land acknowledgement is written. Right? Either you've got the meaningful relationship and then you move into writing the land acknowledgement that reflects that relationship, or you've got the land acknowledgement and it then spurs you into action into developing a relationship with your neighbors. Now, sometimes when I tell people that this needs to be a, a, a relationship driven process, they look at me like I have two heads. Like indigenous people, how can we possibly build relationships with indigenous people? That's so such a foreign concept. But I would ask you, how do you build relationships with anyone? How do you make a new friend? How do you meet your new neighbors? It's just a process of visiting, right? We have to commit to spending time with one another, to showing our faces at events in the same way you would build a friendship with anyone. How do you make sure that you're supporting them and their priorities and creating space for them to support you and yours? This is a two-way street. For indigenous peoples, it's not just about ourselves as human beings, it's also about our more than human kin. So how in this process of making commitments can we also think about supporting our more than human relatives? How can we think about supporting our lands and waters, our plant and animal relations? How can that also be a part of the commitments that we make through this land acknowledgement? Again, they need to be truthful, right? We have to commit ourselves to sitting with difficult information and to reckoning with it in a really honest way. Focusing on indigenous people in the present and in the future and with that very clear commitment to action steps. 
Now this one I want to be very clear about. Land acknowledgements are not the responsibility of Native people. Now let me say what I mean by that. Indigenous peoples know where our homelands are. We're very clear. We don't need a statement to tell us where our, where our homelands are. Land acknowledgements are in some ways an act of apology and repair. And so the onus of who does that apologizing and who initiates that repair work is not the people who were harmed. It's the people who did the harming and their descendants. And so we need to, even me as an Anishinaabe person, right, I'm, I'm occupying the Dakota homelands. So I too have an obligation here to think about what is my role in addressing these harms, okay? Now sometimes folks get a little anxious about, well, you know, my family wasn't here when the Dakota people were forced marched out of the state. Why is it my job? Well, it's our job because all of us that live in Northfield right now are living in Northfield because of that forced exile. And so it wasn't our choice, but we benefit from it in ways that we really need to address. So what can that tangible action look like? There are so many options and so many ways to go about this, ranging from first, the thing that we've committed to in the version of the land acknowledgement that the task force has written, acts of honest storytelling. Just telling the truth. That seems like it's not that big of a lift. Just committing to learning the right history, the accurate history, and to sharing it with others. Then we can commit to building relationships, to doing that very simple work that I mentioned. And I know COVID complicates these things, but thinking about how to be a good neighbor and a good friend, how to be a good relative to our plant and animal relations and to the lands and waters that we live around. There are also beautiful examples like the Pawnee Seed Project of people who decide to partner with each other. We have so many fertile lands that we are blessed to be around in Northfield. What would it mean to partner with Dakota people on projects that would involve the stewardship of traditional medicines or traditional crops that they might want access to? And these are open questions, right? We can't know the answers until we actually ask Dakota people, what are your desires? What are your priorities and how can we partner with you in those things? So these are examples of partnerships from other Native nations. And then you might see on social media that the hashtag land back has exploded in the last couple of years. And there are people who are legitimately doing this work of repatriating and rematriating lands to Indigenous peoples. Dr. Christine Sleeter on her blog keeps an ongoing list of individual families, churches, schools that have given land back to Indigenous peoples. Now that may seem like a big ask, but let's think about that in the context of the wildfires that are raging in California. If you were listening to NPR this week, you likely heard them talking about how indigenous fire practices, controlled burns, if they had been continually practiced, could have avoided these kinds of massively destructive climate fires that we're seeing now. So how can we think about this kind of urgent moment of climate disasters and how indigenous stewardships can be a life-saving thing for all of us and why those types of ecological partnerships might be so critical in this moment. Okay, I want, to walk, I want us to walk through just two examples of what I think are pretty successful land acknowledgements. So I'm gonna take a second and let you read this that's on the screen and then I wanna point out a few things to you. Okay, so just a few notes here. One is that this is, there is a nod in that very first line to traditional and ancestral, that would be past tense, and contemporary, that immediate no, nod to the present. Then there's a note about these histories being complicated, right? There are multiple nations that lay claim to the area that we understand of, that we understand as, as Duluth. So we've got Ojibwe people, Dakota people, Northern Cheyenne people, and other native nations since time immemorial. There is a reckoning here with the legal moments where land changed hands. So a nod to the treaty, to the 1854 treaty. And in the same breath, a recognition of a contemporary and ongoing significance to Ojibwe and Dakota people and Northern Cheyenne people for that region. And then here's the commitment. Here's the tangible commitment. 
to support and advocate for a recognition and affirmation, a supporting of tribal sovereignty, to holding the university as a whole accountable to supporting the governance of Native peoples. Here's another one. Take another second to read this one. Okay. So again, I just want to point you in that first paragraph to these multiple competing claims. This list of land acknowledgement does not shy away from the fact that what we now understand of as Chicago is a place that a lot of Native people lay claim to. And so it says that outright. Then in the second paragraph, there is a nod to the present. This, again, this idea that Indigenous people live in Chicago. In fact, Chicago has got one of the most uh, populous, populous and, and vibrant Indigenous communities, um, urban communities in the country. And th then further down in that third paragraph, this idea that the Newberry is going to make a tangible commitment to telling this history and to being in right relation with Native nations and to educating down at the bottom, its users in, again, this really explicit language, history of dispossession and of settler colonialism. So let's bring all of that information now home to us here in Northfield. We know, as Mara shared with us at the beginning, that Northfield is located on Dakota homeland, specifically those of the Wapakuta band. Now, I want to give you a little bit of historical context. Northfield was founded in 1855. That is eight years, seven years before the U.S. Dakota War and eight years before the state of Minnesota exiled Dakota people from the state. The 1840s, 50s, 60s, and 70s were the sort of end of the treaty making period. And it was a time when treaty making was widely deceitful and coercive. The United States would designate people who just happened to be in the area as official representatives of native nations without necessarily ensuring that those were the official government representatives of the nation. Sometimes what indigenous people thought they were agreeing to was not actually what the treaty said. If you compare treaties in the indigenous language and in English, sometimes they're not even necessarily saying the same thing. And in some cases, treaties were actually changed after tribal leaders had signed them. So these treaties were used as a tool for dispossession in the decades leading up to the US Dakota War and in fact, across, across the continental United States. Carleton was founded only three years after Dakota people were marched out of the state and St. Olaf was founded only 11 years after. If you're interested in learning more about histories of treaties and of dispossession through the treaties, I strongly suggest that you Google the Indian Land Tenure Foundation, which has a useful guide to this, or if that you check out this book, The Relentless Business of Treaties by Martin Case, which is from the Minnesota Historical Society Press and offers a really great introduction to treaty history. There's a lot that we still don't know about the indigenous history of Northfield. I've got students working with me this upcoming spring in a new class called Indigenous Histories at Carleton, where we'll be doing some of this uh, research. I, uh, Northfield now also has an, an intern, and maybe Beth can tell us a little bit about her work. Um, I don't know if she's with us on the call tonight. Uh, that Anna will also be doing some of this research, I understand, as well. So while I cannot sit here in front of you tonight and say with absolute definitive proof that the Dakota expulsion from southern Minnesota allowed the town of Northfield to grow, we can say with pretty strong confidence that Carleton, St. Olaf, other institutions around us, other towns that grew up just after us, that all of this expansion of non-Dakota families was possible in this area because Dakota people were pushed out. Without, uh, without, again, focusing on the present, we lose a lot of the picture. So I want to note that there are uh, 11 Native nations that share geography with the state of Minnesota today. Seven are Ojibwe and four are Dakota. And our closest Dakota neighbors belong to the Midwakanton Band today. They are in Shakopee, Prairie Island, and Lower Sioux. 
And they're the fourth Native nation that shares, the Dakota nation that shares boundaries with Minnesota today is Upper Sioux, which is just a little bit further away from us. There are also Dakota nations today in Nebraska and South Dakota. And there is a Dakota community in Manitoba where some Dakota people fled to during the US Dakota War. And then of course we would be remiss if we didn't note that just 45 minutes north of Northfield, there is a massive urban native community which includes many Dakota people. So to return to the language that the task force has, has put together so far, it currently reads, we stand on the homelands of the Wapakuta Band of the Dakota Nation. We honor with gratitude the people who have stewarded the land throughout the generations and their ongoing contributions to this region. We acknowledge the ongoing injustices that we've committed against the Dakota Nation, and we wish to interrupt this legacy, beginning with acts of healing and honest storytelling about this place. So note again, commitments to tangible action, a nod to the present, ongoing injustices. So there are things that this land acknowledgement does that are drawing directly from those uh, or really paralleling those examples that I pointed to earlier of land acknowledgements that are really doing the work. Now, in my own course, I get to have an expanded version of this because it's not necessarily going to be read aloud and it goes right in the syllabus. So I did want to share with you the way that I've expanded this uh, for my students. So what I've written here is, is very much built on that land acknowledgement that the task force has written and I'll give you a moment to read it. Now, in this, I want to note that I am not a Dakota person. My family is Turtle Mountain Ojibwe, and I was raised in North Carolina as a result of my family's relationships with the military and my parents' choices about where to go to school. And so I am also coming to this fresh, right? This is history that I am currently having to teach myself, and I am not the expert. But I can tell you that there are wonderful resources like this book. Minnesota Makoche, The Land of the Dakota by Gwen Westerman and Bruce White that tell this history in really compelling ways. There are also other resources that I'm going to point to in just a moment to help you learn this history as well. And here we are. So every, uh, many Native nations have someone on staff who is a Tribal Historic Preservation Officer or TIPO. These are people whose job is the stewardship of cultural artifacts and tribal histories and they often are directly involved in relationships with external bodies like the federal government, state government, and in some cases, universities. So Minnesota has a list uh, on state government's website of these uh, 11, of the TIPOs for the 11 tribal governments in the state. Those would be great contacts to start having conversations with. There are also so many books and museum exhibits and resources that can help us to educate ourselves about this. There's an educator, Darlene St. Clair, who's developed a curriculum with the nonprofit Nakota Wichoha that, that has a sixth grade curriculum that they can provide for local public school teachers. The book that I just mentioned. Uh, the, the Minnesota Humanities Center has the Why Treaties Matter exhibit, which, by the way, is available in full online and will be at Carleton next fall. Then there is the Minnesota History Center's new exhibit, Our Home Native Minnesota, the Bedote Memory Map website, for those of you who are teachers on the call with us this evening, they offer an annual training, several, a series of trainings for public school teachers to learn how to use that curriculum in your classrooms. And then lastly, and I want to note that this remains open during the pandemic, is the Hochokarati Museum in Prior Lake. I've taken my students there. It is a brilliantly curated space run by the Shakti Midwakton Sioux community. And then Lastly, that there are Dakota historians and scholars and teachers and knowledge keepers right in our area who can help us doing this as we do this work. 
And in that, going back to the idea from earlier that this is not necessarily the work that indigenous people should just do out of the goodness of their hearts, that is labor. And as such, it needs to be compensated, right? There's this beautiful quote that's been floating around social media in the last several months that has to do with if your racial justice, if your social justice initiative puts more work on BIPOC people, then maybe it's not social justice. And so thinking about ways to recognize that labor and compensate people for it when they're doing it. I wanna close with just this thought. A land acknowledgement is at its core, above all, an opportunity to be in better relation with one another. It is a commitment, a, going back to what Mar was saying about this being an opportunity to build peace together. It is a commitment to being in right relation with each other and with the lands and waters where we live. It's a chance to acknowledge our past and commit to building a better shared future. Miigwech for your time. I appreciate you letting me be here with you tonight. Thank you so much, Meredith. Um, this is Barb Warrenson. I'm the chair of the Human Rights Commission and we are open for questions. There was a, it was a, I'm gonna give you a minute to, to write in your chat. If you see at the bottom of your Zoom, it says chat and you just click on that and it comes up and you can write a message to, uh, to everyone or to a, uh, a specific person, but for this, I hope you'll, you'll write it to everyone. So can you see those, Meredith, the questions? I yes, I can. Um, I, don't, I don't see chat. Um, oh, under more, maybe? Let me see. It's under, I don't know if it's different on the phone, but it's Zoom, so it shouldn't be. There's, do you see where it says participants? Um, I see the chat with nine people, but I don't see where I get on the chat. <laughs> Click on that. Oh, well, you're up. <laughs> do you see okay. the can you just click on it or you're on a phone? I don't know how you would do that. Uh, on a phone, if you click more, like you might have to tap your screen to show all the buttons, but there is more and then chat does pop up there. Okay. Oh, okay. All right, I see chat with nine. I hadn't clicked on it. Oh, okay. Okay, I see. And you can, you can type, whoa, let me see. I'm sorry to hold people up with questions like this. Um, Everybody a chance to, to put in their questions or their comments. And while you know. folks are doing that, um, could, I, could I call on someone actually? Um, Please do. Susan, Susan Garwood is educating me over here in the chat and I am so grateful. Um, Susan, would you mind possibly unmuting yourself for a second and sharing what you know? <laughs> Sure. Sorry, I I didn't. Necessarily, I'm happy to share the knowledge publicly. I um, just Meredith, when you mentioned that you were teaching the class, I wanted to chime in a little bit. A uh, little bit of background. I'm the executive director of the Rice County Historical Society, and uh, in talking about the Dakota story, it is one of the lesser known stories. Is that it wasn't a monolithic experience that for about 80 to 120 Dakota, who many of whom had a mixed blood uh, family member, usually a patriarch, um, they were not required to leave the state. They had in some cases already begun to try and assimilate. They had perhaps become farmers um, and so on, living on the land and had taken intentional efforts to protect or not participate. They were the ones who were serving as guards and so on. Um, uh, during the war, uh, Teope is one of them, um, I believe Chief Good Thunder and some of his family members or others. Um, at any rate, uh, after the war, uh, Bishop Whipple, who uh, plays an important role during that 1862 uh, US conflict, um, or after actually, um, he, he turned to Henry Sibley, who is much, uh, many opinions about Sibley. Um, at any rate, he turns to Sibley and says, but not all of the Dakota should be required to leave. And Sibley says, yes, I agree, but where are they going to be safe? Because of course the entire state, it was unsafe to be a Dakota. At any rate, Whipple said, send them to Faribault, we'll protect them. And he said, where? And he said, Whipple, or Sibley said, where? Whipple said, I don't know, we'll figure it out. And Whipple turned to Alexander Faribault, who was himself half Dakota, 
Um, and Alexander said, sure, put them on my land. So for about 20 years after the conflict, there were uh, quite a number of people living in Faribault who had, um, they were farming, they were, um, many of them had owned land by this point in time. Uh, they were working, uh, going to church and, and so on. Um, and so um, after the, um, about 18, starting in the 1880s, early 90s, they were selling their land and moving to the Lower Sioux Indian community because the Lower Sioux community actually was um, organic in that they, the Dakota, um, purchased the land because this group, not only did they not have to leave, they were able to actually stay and own land here in Minnesota. At any rate, the point of all of this is that Rice County's story is more, even more complicated than is before. Um, we in Faribault, of course, tell that the story, actually we go back, uh, our, when we do our narrative, we actually go back 15,000 years because we actually have artifacts that have been found in Rice County that are that old. Um, so at any rate, um, it's absolutely a story worth telling. It's complicated, um, but it's dynamic. Darlene, I think I mentioned to you, Darlene, who you mentioned, Darlene St. Clair, her family, a portion of her family actually traces itself back to the Dakota who were in Faribault after the conflict. And my point of sending the message to you, Meredith, was if your class is interested, if I can assist or share information or even just be an ear in your own experience, I would be honored to be a part of that in whatever way I can be. Susan, thank you so much. That's, that is so helpful in, you know, I feel like in Native history, often when we think things are simple, we pull things, pull the page back and then you find out that it's, it is always more complicated than it appears. Um, and I, I just really, uh, I should have included the Rice County Historical Society on that list of resources, and I'm, I'm sorry that I did not do that. So no, not, a, not at all. That I, I, again, it was sent to you privately as, as an educator, because this isn't necessarily the platform for learning everything you could possibly want to know about Dakota history in one hour or less, um, but rather to address the um, fabulous work of the land acknowledgement that the. Um, committee has been working on. So again, sorry to commandeer the meeting, but oh, thanks for sharing, Meredith. Thank you so much for that additional information. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Susan. That's very helpful. <laughs> um, so do you want to take the, I, I see um, a note from Gina Washburn, encouraging everybody to um, support the, the work of the Land acknowledgement. I, I know that we will be going back again in early October to the city council to um, ask them to look at it again. Uh, so Gina suggests that those who support it should make their position known. Um, and Dorothea Rossaway has, has a comment she'd like to make. Dorothea, you want to unmute and address us? Thank you. Um, I hesitate to go uh, before Joan because I always love hearing what Joan has to say. But Joan, do you want to go before me or shall I go? No, no, you can. No, I, okay. I feel the same way about you. So, no okay. Problem. Well, um, I I want to just share a few thoughts. Um, first of all, there were times in the past before um, what Mar was talking about that we did celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day. The first time that I know about was in 1992 when we didn't want to celebrate the quincentennial. You know, they were having this big oh, national quincentennial. And we had a year long study here in Northfield every month, once a month at the UCC church. We brought in native people from South Dakota and from other places to come and talk with us in, and local native people too, who lived there, here then um, and teach us what things we needed to know and um, discuss and we looked at one of the things we did we looked at the high school textbooks the thick ones and there were five references to native history at that time in 1992 and one of the authors was from northfield one of the editor whatever you call it who, who compiles the history he was furious with us about that that we brought that out another thing we did was um we had this great big huge gathering with a wonderful, wonderful medicine man from Prairie Island who came and spoke 
And that was on October 12th, instead of celebrating Indigenous Peoples Day. And there were other things that we did after that. Um, there, there were some Native people, and in fact, my adopted daughter, she's Dakota Lakota, um, adopted in the Lakota tradition. Uh, uh, it's not formal, you know. Um, she used to um, lead uh, runs and um, from far, far away to go through um, Minnesota, um, uh, and often in the winter time, to go to Mankato to the to the um, the big celebration that happens in Mankato. And if people haven't been to that, I don't know what the, they're planning it for this year. But I don't know if they'll carry it out. But to if if and if you don't know what I'm talking about, that's the site of the largest mass execution uh -huh. ever in the U.S. when the 38 plus two Dakota were executed. Um, and there's a long history to that. It, they originally wanted the governor and others in this in the state wanted 200 executed, but Lincoln would only sign for the 38. Um, he, th that's complicated. I won't get into that because it would take too much time to explain it all. But anyway, they have this um, this remembrance um, of that and recognition of that the day after Christmas every year since then, because it happened the day after Christmas and 3,000, 2,000, 2,000 white folks showed up to watch that execution happen. So that's part of our history that we have to claim and recognize and reckon with and witness that we were part of, you know, that that, 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 that went on in our ancestry. Um, and I found out recently, or I thought about recently, that my church, the UCC Church, was founded in um, 1856. And uh, so that was in the middle of the forced extermination, the forced removal, the ethnic cleansing, the extermination, and the genocide that happened on this land. That, that was in the middle of that. So I want to invite my church, and I think there are several of you here tonight, to recognize that our church formed during that time and, and the importance of, of witnessing that and owning that, that we, that we benefited from genocide is, I, I think, a really important thing that we do. And I also want to invite Carlton to do that as well, since, as you said, Meredith, it formed in that time period too, um, when all of this was happening in, the, in this state and, and people had to be aware of it. Um, another thing I think is important in the history, um, or I like what the Northwestern quote said, by the way, uh, we don't e exist in, a, it doesn't exist in a past tense. It's something that was, that was good because that's, you know, we've had that discussion on the city council, but, um, Another piece of history that I learned from the Minnesota Historical Society one time when I was there is that James J. Hill, the railroad baron, and if you've seen the Hill Mansion in St. Paul, he was extremely wealthy and he had the um, treaty rights for, um, to, he was young in, in his 20s uh, from Scotland who he came through Canada and, and lived in St. Paul. He had the treaty rights to build the railroad from St. Paul all the way to the Pacific. And what they ta taught us at the Minnesota Historical Society was that um, he uh, stole, he had the rights to the railroad bed. He stole 35 miles on both sides of the railroad bed. And he went to, he sent his, his cohorts to Europe, his henchmen to Europe to England and Ireland during the potato famine, to Scandinavia, to Germany, in all of those countries where people were suffering from the, um, you know, the economic declines that were happening there. And he offered cheap land, come to the US, you can buy cheap land. It was all stolen land, but the people didn't know that who bought the land. And, um, and you know, the history of, of, um, of Fort Snelling to keep sellers out of Minnesota because the U.S. government liked the trade with the Wapakute because they were canoe people and they, they, they traded with the French Canadian canoers. You know, it was called the River of Canoes for a while. 
and um, and they and the U.S. government liked that trade um, because it was anti-British and it was supporting the French, and so they liked that trade. And the and Fort Snelling was to protect that. But then, you know, as more and more settlers started coming in, and there are, there's a, there are letters from Abraham Lincoln to James J. Hill saying, cease and desist, you cannot sell this land. But because he was in the middle of fighting the Civil War, and the governor um, of Minnesota was pressuring him to become, you know, to become an official state, and all of that was going on, and, um, and support the Civil War. And uh, he, he, you know, he gave in and he gave permission for the execution of the 38. And he also couldn't do anything about James J. Hill because it took so long for mail to come here, you know, two months by horseback or whatever. So James J. Hill sold land all the way across. He built those big, huge hunting mansions in, you know, different parks, in Glacier National Park, for example. And, um, you know, he made his fortune uh, and he built capitalism. He was building his clientele all the way across. So I think it's really important for us to, in Minnesota to recognize that, 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 that stolen land 35 miles on either side of the railroad bed, that's pretty close to, I don't know if it comes exactly to Northfield, but it's pretty close, you know, and that's where all of those Scandinavian immigrants came from and, and came in that time. So I think that's important for us to recognize that. So as I said, I'm, I'm asking my church to really come to terms with this. And I heard recently in, a, in, in an, a, an organization I'm in that's working on ancestral healing, ancestral and collective trauma. And they talk about the three R's, reckoning or recognizing, which is also witnessing. So with the witnessing, as you said, Meredith, is really important. We can't just go to repent and repair. We have to do the witnessing. We have to see what really happened here and face it. So that's what I'm asking my church to do. And I think Carlton um, should, should do that too, considering when we really um, you know, took over. And a, and a good way to face it is as Meredith. Yeah. Yeah. Let me interrupt because we're almost at the end of. of Sorry, the no, I, of I had a lot. Just the last thing I'll say is that um, facing that we benefited from genocide is a really good way to look at that. Thank you for listening. Oh, that was a lot of information. Um, thank you. So we have a comment, another comment, um, Meredith, that I'll, I'll let you comment on uh, uh, that says I was in a recent discussion about this acknowledgement and someone asked what current oppression is occurring in Northfield. Um, I would yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm happy to answer this and then I know Joan had some comments so I, I want to make sure that we get to Joan before we run out of time. Um, one thing is just ongoing invisibility. According to the census there are 200 and at least 250 Native people from tribes across the country that live in what we consider Rice County where are those families? What are we doing to support those families? Uh, there is a federal education program called Title VI that's a federal Indian education uh, cultural support system for Native students that can kick in when a certain number of Native students are within a school or a school district. Uh, have those families been informed that they have a right to those services? You know, those are, those are questions that we could be asking. So one, one form of ongoing oppression is invisibility. And there's a, a wonderful um, Native scholar, Stephanie Freiberg, who talks about invisibility as the current form of racism against Indigenous people. Um, another, and folks who've been in Northfield much longer than I have, have these stories and could share them, uh, perhaps not now if we're, if we're nearly out of time, but um, I have been informed of stories of police brutality against Native people in Northfield. Native students nationwide experience the highest rates of school suspension and, ex uh, suspension and expulsion over 95% of which are for nonviolent acts in school. And those are nationwide statistics, so we would need to drill down in Northfield to look at how they apply here for the, for the children of those, in those 250 people that I mentioned. Uh, but that's certainly a thing that we could consider. So invisibility, police brutality, and uh, disparate uh, outcomes in schools would be, would be just a few. And I would be remiss if I didn't also mention that COVID has had an extremely disparate uh, outcome for Native communities nationwide. You may have been following the news about Navajo Nation, but they are not alone in that. And so certainly we might also ask questions about 
the impact of COVID in Native communities in Minnesota. Um, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to Joan. Joan? Thank you. Hi. Ma'am. Thank you. Thank you uh, for, for what um, I was learning, uh, both from your uh, talk, Meredith, and I thank you for it, and Mara's introduction. But uh, that all that detail in, in um, Dorothea's remarks, um, uh, I'm really uh, grateful for. What I would like to, to share um, uh, is that, uh, well, I hardly know because I'm conscious of time now, <laughs> where to start, but um, uh, is that it is the relationship part of this is where I'd like to, to center my last remarks um, that you started us off with. One of them has to do with um, what we're, where we're going now with what we already have. I like the idea of the collection that's going on at Carleton, and I'd like to, to know that um, uh, St. Olaf is a part of this. And I wondered if, rather than the traditional scholarly thing that takes a longer time to build up, if there could be narrative um, uh, components uh, to a center for gathering stories, such as we just now heard, um, that and videos. And I, I wonder also um, if we would be a little um, um, in the future uh, connected to some of the resources like the Minnesota um, exhibition, where I um, uh, tried to meet Kate Bean. I sent her this language that we're, we're just examining um, that I generated uh, the, several of the remarks for, especially the closing remark and the first one, because I wanted us to, to engage on responsibility. That to me mattered more than anything else, especially as I was reading the records in the library, so that when I produced my Martin Luther King talk, it was that that I wanted to get straight uh, in this verbiage, all right? And so um, I sent that to Bean right after my talk, um, and I had tried to get an appointment with her. I haven't yet, uh, but that had to do with my health more than anything else. Uh, but I would like to see if we could even envision relationship in, in a, a wider band to include narrative reports, because there are wonderful IT and recording studio um, uh, uh, facilities, I think, on both campuses. I know the one at Carleton was superb from some time ago. And then we don't have to wait for refined scholarship, which takes time and publication and all the rest of it. And I'd like also um, that, that that be a part of an invitation for Indigenous Day. If we're going to do it, we need to invite, because I, before I came to the Human Rights Commission in 2019, the fall, September, I didn't know what had gone on before and who was involved in it and all the rest of it. Uh, but if we could kind of uh, include in this uh, next celebration, inv invitation for people to bring stories, bring and have a place where they can deposit them or do clips and tapes and uh, audios and all kinds of things, we could begin to build an oral history as well as a, a narrative um, uh, written and scholarly history and not have to wait um, to get this right. And I also think it's important for attribution, particularly BIPOC people are always ignored and Blacks particularly ignored in their contributions to any building of any structures. <laughs> but you know, uh, this stuff gets just always not, but I think that's true of Native Americans. I think that's true of uh, African-Americans. Uh, you know, I think that's true of BIPOC people, period, that they don't often uh, get their attribution. And here we are talking about reclaiming land. We need to be reclaiming stories and re 
reclaiming the voices of those, you know, carrying those stories. Um, and, and that that should be a conscious part of where, however, to me, uh, of whatever uh, forward movement we make. And I, 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 I don't, I, I'll just leave the rest, but that's what I would like to, to see. Thank you. That's wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Go ahead, Mar. Yeah, there's, there's a question here from Tom. Did you read it? Um, that he is saying displacement of communities has happened for millennia. Is there something unique to American history and this possession that requires this statement, this statement or should these statements be offered globally? I think they should everywhere. We have to repair the damages of the past. We, we have histories that they're the generational trauma of the communities that have been that suffered these injustices way back is still present. It's not something for them that is in the past. It's for the per perpetrators that is in the past. So yeah, I, I don't know the the Meredith or, or the rest, but that I think yeah. I mean so can I just say one thing? Thank you, Mark, for uh, responding to my question. Part of the reason that I wrote that question is because I feel like whenever we take a stance like this, it is appropriate and certainly speaking for myself, I am much more comfortable doing so when I have, uh, sometimes I like to use the term worldview or a more broad or global perspective on the problem as it exists in other areas. And that puts me in a position to address it with a perspective. That's why I asked the question and uh, um, you know, thank you for, thank you for responding to it. Yeah, Tom, th thank you for asking the question. Um, I, I will just say, you know, I, th I think you're right that it's important to have a global context and to think about what's happened to indigenous people here within these histories that for thousands of years, right, within and hundreds and thousands of years of, um, of colonization. Now we're talking about hundreds of years of, of settler colonialism here. Um, I also think it's important as, uh, as you know, civil rights activists, black civil rights activists um, in the 60s would say, right, cast on your bucket where you are. And this is where we are. And so I think it's really critical that even as we maintain that sort of historical context and global context that we focus really critically on what happened here and what is our relationship to Dakota people? And unfortunately, the, the reason that I feel compelled to have to say that so forcefully is because for some people they'll say, well, dispossession is a, a since time immemorial phenomena, what have we really done wrong? And that's a way to sidestep issues that we actually do need to reckon with that are you know, these, these very violent histories that are quite recent and to what Mar was saying, have had an intergenerational impact on people living in our community today. Um, and so I. I agree with you about the importance of the sort of historical and global context. And I also think we need to cast down our bucket where we are and focus on, on the moment that we're in. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I, we have actually gone about 10 minutes over, but I, I wish we could continue to talk. Um, we will follow up with this and, and uh, see what more, what more we can do as we go forward in some of the suggestions that came up, I love the idea of a center that has the stories and working with colleges and, and uh, so stay tuned and thank you so very much. Um, remember I, I wanted to thank they, everybody too. <laughs> thank, thank you. Remember that we are uh, going to have the Indigenous People's Day celebration again this year and it's the 12th of October. We are going to prepare not a lengthy program, but just to tell you what we're working on, which is pretty exciting about a river and the name of the river that is not canon. Just, mm -hmm. just it's not that. It's Iniabostata and it's a river of a standing rock. So we're gonna share that work. So we'll keep you posted for sure. Thank you so much. Thank you, Meredith. Thank you much, everyone. Thank you for being here. Yes, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank and you. consider going to Mankato if they hold that ceremony. Definitely. The day after Christmas. Okay. Mm -hmm.